Oliver G here with the Earful Tower. This week, we're talking all about a book, A Year in Provence, by Peter Mayle. The reason that I'm talking about this book is, well, it's two or threefold, really. It's because it was kind of a game-changer when it came to books about France. It was this uh, fish out of water, an Englishman living in Provence, writing all about it. And it really sort of sparked the genre that continues to this day. A lot of the guests I've had on the show have written similar kind of books about how they moved to France and the challenges. Uh, another reason that I did this, uh, I'm doing this episode is because we went on the honeymoon to the exact village where it was set, Menard. Lena and I went and visited it. And uh, while I was there, I even talked to someone working in the hospitality industry about how how over 30 years it sort of changed the face of the village. Maybe not visually, but it changed the mentality and how it brought tourism, the impact it had on one village in France. Uh, and the third reason I'm doing it is because it was the book, the October book for the Eiffel Tower Book Club, the first ever book. And I figured it was a good chance to, to give a little behind the scenes on this book and, and its place in France, French culture and French history. So on with the episode, let's start, as always, with Slim and the Beast. And here for Tower listeners, the honeymoon may be over. That doesn't mean I still can't talk about things that happen on the honeymoon, and that doesn't mean I can't do it with... None. Me! <laughs> None other than lovely Lena. Hi. How are you feeling? I'm um, great, thank you. Do you How still... are you feeling? I don't know, sometimes I feel like I should be moving on the road and sitting still. I know, still. I feel like I'm still vibrating. It's like a phantom limb. Yes. Have you heard about that? I know. So when you lose an arm or something and then you can still feel that... You yeah, you have like a third it. scooter leg. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's how I feel. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're here, as I said in the introduction, to talk about... Something we did that was rather unusual for both of us, and that's we went to a village that was the setting of a, of a, of a book, like some kind of groupies. I know. It's a sort of pilgrimage, yeah, I suppose. Which is weird as well, because that part of France is not so far from the pilgrimage route that they do down through the, the, the Spanish mountains and stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's a pilgrimage area. So, uh, <laughs> but what we're, it here, is. what we're here to talk about, Peter Mayle the book, how we visit it, what the what the locals uh, sort of think about it. But first, I think we'll just get into a little bit of the facts. So the book was written in 1989. So at the time of this podcast coming out, it's almost 30 years. Mm. Uh, I mean, I've, I've mentioned it, I'll talk about it later. We've discussed it in depth in the book club, not just yeah. me and you. Did it dissected it. Yeah, 150, 150 or so people dissecting it. Mm. Um, but... What was interesting about it is this book has drawn, since it was written in 1989, has drawn people like us, tourists, to the the village of Menab to see it. Yeah, it seems to have been an un, undying appetite yeah. for the for the French village. Speaking of appetite, that one in particular. Speaking of appetite, the, uh, if if you've never heard of the book before, uh, it does delve a lot into food and uh yeah in detail in much, great detail too much in your i thought opinion. maybe a little bit too much but that's just me but he was a foodie he was a foodie right yeah and listen to this so i read his obituary oh okay so he died uh in january this year so in 2018 and i, I like this bit in one of his last interviews i'm reading from the telegraph here males males they sp- they wrote his name wrong it's male so there you go, there's a mistake oh, in the males. telegraph. In one of his last interviews, Males was asked about dying. Uh, and he said, I loathe funerals. I would prefer not to have one. Instead, I'd like to put aside enough in my will for a lavish lunch for a few friends. I've often thought the best time to die would be after a long lunch, just before the bill arrives. Yeah, I mean, you sort of feel like you are dead. You just feel like you're in a coma, a food coma. Well, food coma. <laughs> just before the bill arrives, I like that. So, um, so what... I think we'll start with before we give our impressions of the of the village is how we arrived there. Then mm. we'll hear from Kara, a resident in in the in the village who I interviewed while I was there. Mm, yeah. And then we'll sort of end on a little note about about our dissection of the book itself. Yeah? Sounds good. So the way we went there is we were and we I think we mentioned this briefly in one of the podcast episodes from the road, but we came up from Aix-en-Provence, which also features in the book, and we went to some of the restaurants that he mentioned. 
Uh, also in great details, especially how the young ladies were sitting and flicking their hair. I'm yeah. not so sure it aged that well, that no, bit. No, that bit he did go into a fair bit of detail about yeah. watching the young ladies from... <laughs> from afar? From afar. <laughs> Anyways. Anyway, so he, um, so we followed the road across the, the mountains, not the Alps, which we did later, but some quite big... Mm. It was our first taste of mountains as we travelled past the... Uh, past a lot of those little hilltop villages. And yeah. before we came down to this town of Menherbe, Menherbe, Menherbe. we uh, went to a place called Bonnieu, which exactly. is up a really beautiful, really, really It's like stunning. a really high up on a hilltop, I suppose, mm-hmm. looking out over the valley. And it was really nice because we went in and there was a, there was a really good bar as you're leaving the, the top of the village that we missed because we stopped first. We got hungry, yeah. acutely. And Hungry. well, uh, for a coffee, if I remember, and to charge our phones up. Yeah. And so we arrived there, and, and there was a, a really beautiful restaurant, and uh, and the guy said we couldn't eat there unless we were we couldn't go in there unless we we're eating, and we said, ah, oh, you know, just for a coffee. Like the place was obviously empty, and he sort of looked around. He goes, okay, come in, and he took us into this back room with this amazing view over the valley. And I was like, oh. Yeah. Uh, perfect. So I got talking to him, and that was our first introduction to to Peter Mail and his his life there. And his legacy. And the guy was a big fan of the book. He he lived there his whole year, uh, his whole life, and he and he, uh, he 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 said that he said the best thing about that book is it's exactly accurate. That's what life is like in this village. Mm. The the it's as difficult as he says it is to uh, to get through life in France. He said if if a worker is going to take their time, you can expect it'll take twice as long. And he uh, <laughs> and he he raved about it and said how good the book had been for tourism. Yeah, he yeah exactly. Mm. He said that it really it helped them a mm. lot. And so then what we did is uh and and then later reading the book because we were reading it as we went, we got to the sort of second half of the book. He goes to that town a lot. I wish we'd sort of. I know maybe yeah. we're a bit more aware of that fact, but that's okay. Mm. We can still picture it. So then, uh, then we got to the town, and one thing that I was really hesitant about, I say town, it's a village, it's a tiny little village. Yes. Um, and one thing I was really hesitant about, because I'd read this review of the book, so the book is called A Year in Provence, and Washington Post uh, wrote an article five years after it was published called A Sneer in Provence, mm-hmm. where a writer, Sharon Waxman, uh, went to Provence, and she, she basically read the book and wanted to go and find if it was... Accurate. Yes. In other words, uh, if all the things he'd said about... So a lot of the readers of the book in the book club were saying that it was, he was quite negative about everything. Tourists. Um, the French. The French. In general. Englishmen, Americans. Mm. But so, the so this, system, everything. Yeah. So Sharon Waxman, in A Sneer in Provence, uh, basically summarized that people weren't very happy with the male effect. And, uh, like, for example, let me read a bit... Uh, a, a tiny old man with a blue beret sticks out his nose and says, Alors, don't you... There's, it's written in sort of French accent. Alors, don't you talk to me about that one, eh, no? Oh, the farmer's at the bar. Oh, no, not that bit. Eh, no? He's a joke, says one. He's a pain in the rear, says another. Nobody knows him here. You know? He came, he observed, he didn't live with the people. He missed the point. Look, the least he could do was be complimentary. He didn't need to come here and say it's rotten. Mm-hmm. I only did the French accent because she wrote it that way. Yeah, she implied. Mm, right. That's and how it should be read. <laughs> anyway, so I'm, I'm, and it continues like that for, for two pages worth. And so I was really hesitant going in there, knowing that not only have uh, journalists been going there since 1995 looking asking around, about asking questions. It being, yes, exactly. Not only that, but also knowing, as I read in his obituaries and in and parts of his later books, that people would just go to his house sometimes uh, unin- well, always uninvited. And once he said he found some Italians swimming in his pool. <laughs> so this Imagine book was, that. This book had a huge effect on a lot of people. I think a lot of people, maybe, they thought, oh, we're in the French countryside in a tiny village and there's this English author right. and I feel like I know him. Right. Like, I feel like he would care about me yeah. coming there and say hello and say that I read it. And yeah, because oh, I... do you remember, in, we started reading his second book. Yes, uh, yeah. So I think Toujours Provence is called. And he said how nice it was at first when people would show up mm. and then he started saying how much he hated it yeah and he had to move so I, I felt guilty I felt guilty going in there 25 or 30 years after it Me was written too. and doing the same thing but we had a lot of luck because I met a woman called Kara who you're about to hear from who had only been living there for a short while I think she just moved there within the year mm. and she was a really interesting woman she spoke excellent English as you're about to hear and she said uh, before 
uh, before what I play now, she was talking about how her grandfather was from the village of Menaub, uh, but he died in the Second World War fighting for the French resistance. Wow, and there's her, lots, lots of history right, there. Right, right. And so her grandmother and mother fled to Switzerland where Cara grew up. Right? I see, yes. Moving back to the village of Menaub very recently, working mm. in a cafe. So in a way, we, we were lucky to find someone who hadn't been there for 30 years and heard the same questions. And haven't had the time to get bored of it yet, I suppose. Exactly. So I'm just going to play the interview that uh, that I uh, did with her on the street. You can picture it. We were on that the the sort of main street going up away from the the, the valley edge and uh, where there's little shops and bakeries and cafes. Really charming. And uh, yeah, this is what Cara had to say. Tell me about uh, how... Peter Mail's book, A Year in Provence, has changed things over the course of 20 years or what you've heard mm-hmm. or what you've noticed? I think there was a rush once the book came out. Um, you know, everybody wanted to come here and find Peter Mail. <laughs> um, uh, so that was sort of a rush there and he left quite quickly after that. He stayed a little bit on, um, went back to the States. And people here, French, don't adapt to foreigners you know they're French and they love their heritage and their culture so I think many just said if the tourists don't want to adapt you can go somewhere else <laughs> so many people have been coming here for 20 years they bought houses here house market prices went up all of those things but because it's a national park as well and you, you know you can't just go around renovating and doing things it stayed the same since I've been coming here which is much longer than 27 years, much older than that. It hasn't changed. It just hasn't changed. And then some people come here now, which I meet now, now I work here, uh, and they say, oh, we've been planning for 25 years to come here, and finally we made it. So there's sort of this love also for what he wrote about, which then when they come here, it's real. Mm. He described it in a way that just fascinated people, that this must be a dream, and in a way it is, you know, off and on. So, yeah. I met in, in Bonnier just before a French man, he said, life in the area is exactly like yeah. it's described in the yeah. book. Yeah, it is, it yeah. is. He just really pinpointed it in his American English way, and uh, that really hooked people. They really wanted to see it. So, yeah, no, and I enjoy, you know, people here and showing them where to go and not to go, and not going to the tourist trap. And so, um, yeah, no, it's, it's just really, really, really lovely. And because it's a national park, it can't change. And it's how, by law. What, how often do people uh, come in to you and ask you details about the book or where he lives? Uh, if they hear that I uh, speak English, yes. French people don't care. Yeah. So, the, <laughs> so how often do the tourists ask you? Uh, quite a lot. Yeah. Every day? Yeah. I would say probably two or three times a week. And what do they ask typically? Well, just uh, oh, Manav, do you know where? Uh, um, as you, do you know where he lived? And I said, as I no, asked. No, 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 I have no idea. <laughs> and well, I know he lived in Vosgin or Vosgin, um, where his wife still lives, and near Lourmara. Uh, that's where he moved back and chose that part. So. Um, and it's also, oh, as you said, have you met him? No, <laughs> I haven't met him. I've seen him, uh, but you know, I was younger then and I wasn't interested either in meeting him. I read the book and then I saw the movie in England, which they made, you know, like a series from right. the one year, which was a really good, good uh, series. Um, and they, they sort of made it here. But I would say another funny film, are you seen uh, A Good Year right. with Russell Crowe? Sure. Yeah. It's really, I mean, it's really made here and in Gort. Have you been to Gort? Not yet. No, no. Also a little bit touristy, uh, lots of people. But it, it's really emphasized the French and the foreigner, the English or Australian or whatever it was. Um, I just l- really like that movie. So what do you think uh, people who live here, like locals who don't work in tourism, what do you think they think about all the tourists that are here? I think because they know that their fellow French actually make a good living of it and can do that because here the season is very short i mean here it's open between end of april beginning of may until now september and then they close in october who, That's who do you mean they close no like the uh, these businesses yeah. yeah businesses restaurants and then the winter time that it's closed because there's nobody here or rarely anybody so it's a very short season and of course you have to make your living for the rest of the year um so Everybody depends on it, even if you don't work in the service or anything like that, you know, for shops to be able to be open, post office, all of that. So everybody depends 
on sort of everybody doing well so in a way interest. in a way deep down people have a lot to be thankful for yeah. then yeah 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 and it changed slowly uh, then boomed sort of quite a little bit when he moved away okay. um, so no I think everybody benefits and because it can't be moved here it hasn't been exploited do you see what I mean yeah yeah they can't build uh, a skyscraper no no absolutely no. not uh, and because it stayed the same then people are okay no that's good I've got one last question for you sure. I know you have to go and no, work no 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 that's fine uh, a lot of people when reading the books have said that perhaps the author is a bit condescending and patronizing towards French people. Now you have, you've lived abroad, you've lived in Switzerland and London, you have an outside perspective as a French person. Yeah, but I'm well. also French, yeah. Exactly. So yeah. what do you think? You have a good perspective to be yeah. able to comment on mm. this. I think what he describes well is actually when a foreigner comes to France, because France is France and <laughs> it's always been like this. So like you live in Paris, right? And, and Parisians are very Parisians and here people are more countryside and make a living with their hands, right? And, and you know, from, from the earth here. So in a way I can understand his frustration, uh, in, in a way. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also the charm of actually two cultures <laughs> coming together and trying to make a living. To get, uh, does that make sense to, to you? Yeah, to make to it describe work. It? Yeah, to make it work. Because he had demands that weren't uh, French, in a way, what he wanted to be done. And I think what is, isn't quite described in the book, that many people have two or three jobs here. And that's in, in the summertime, you know, from spring to spring, because they have to make a living. So if you're a carpenter, yes, but maybe you have a vineyard or you grow strawberries or anything like that, right? Or you have uh, help out your, your neighbors or your sister, right? So people are not just in one business. They do a little bit of everything. Uh, the same here with this shop owner. She doesn't just uh, do this. She has other sort of engagements. Uh, and, you know, so people can't be just carpeting. Mm. <laughs> they need to be in other places at times. And French don't think that if you say 12 o'clock, that does can't mean 1 o'clock right. or maybe 12.30. Yeah. Because, you know, you can meet the tractor on the way. Yeah. Hey, it's busy. <laughs> you have to wait. So I think that's also the charm that, that in a way he describes. Condescending? No, just culture clash, I would say. <laughs> So that was Cara, that was interesting to hear a bit of local perspective, which we also got from a few other people who didn't want to be recorded, probably had been there for 30 years. Talk to I her. heard it all before. Yeah, especially the woman in the taba and the sort of bar. Yeah. And I think as soon as we as we brought up Peter well, Mail, yeah. she kind of soured. I know. The thing is, and I felt... I felt I've, So when I worked as a journalist, I felt guilty. Not guilty, but some questions are very tough to ask people. Mm. And this this one was right up there, uh, asking a woman who for thirty years is because her bar, <laughs> it was mentioned in the book, it's heavily yeah heavily negatively. featured. Yeah, they said in it was a negative a, way. He said that the the interior was he said it was an interior, uh, an interior decorator's nightmare. nightmare or something exactly. Like that. Mm. So people have been going in there forever, probably asking the same questions. We did the same. Uh, she wasn't having any of it. First, she was lovely. Yeah. First, when she didn't know our <laughs> our aim. Yeah. Um. Then not so much. Yeah. But um, I figure, <laughs> I figure, I figure I'll read because uh, because it's been so long since the book and people maybe haven't read the book, don't know anything about it. A bit more mm, context. Of One of the some of the new versions of the book come out with with an afterward uh, written by the author. So uh, listen to this. Uh, a year in Provence was first published in 1990 with a first printing considered more than adequate at the time of 3,000 copies. Since then, to my delight and astonishment, writes Peter Mayle, it has sold six million copies in 40 languages. Six million. Mm. This, I had no idea. This inevitably is a source of great irritation to some people who will insist from their vantage points in New York, London or Paris that I'm helping to ruin Provence. How they can be so certain with their knowledge of the region is severely limited by the inconvenient fact that they don't live here is not explained. Even so, their criticism has prompted me to compare the Provence of 1990 with the Provence of 2010. What has changed? The price of... And then he goes on to say the price of real estate's th gone up. Uh, do you think he feels like he has to stand up for himself? I th it feels I like a retribution well, kind of well, letter. Well, yeah, he he um, he moved after so many tourists came. He moved to um, America, mm. and then when he came back to Provence again, he lived in another village, sort yeah. of around on the other side of Bonnier. But he says, you know, like uh, 
every they'll continue. There are now more good restaurants and pleasant places to stay than there used to be. More Michelin stars, more bistros, more chambres d'hôte. In other words, more choice. The local wines have improved. Uh, but as far as change, that's about it. And that goes back to what Cara was saying. Yeah, exactly. Uh, obviously, the afterward goes on, but I'm not going to read the whole book. Um, <laughs> but what she was saying about it's so hard for... Because it's in a national park, beautiful, mountainous national park. Yeah, so not much can actually change. Mm, which leads us really nicely into our thoughts of the village. Yes, What definitely. I mean, what was your sort of overwhelming takeaway from it? The overwhelming takeaway was at first, I guess I was surprised how empty it was. Mm. It was because we went there late, Very late September. September. Yeah. Right and, before uh, it got cold. Yeah, definitely in low fact, season. In Beautiful fact, day. The very the car from the interview when I turned it off said um, she said it's going to rain tonight and if it doesn't rain tonight it will rain tomorrow morning and that was all the clue I needed <laughs> to head north to get out yeah. quickly. But it was empty, wasn't it? It was mm. and beautiful, mm. really well kept, really clean. I felt like it was kind of upmarket. The whole yeah. the whole village felt upmarket and a bit luxurious or even it even says as you come into the town that it's one of the most the plus beau village de france mm. like the most beautiful villages which is and i had no idea because mm. reading the book i i didn't get that picture at well, all i think it's also because he lives or he lived and his place was in the um like the valley a bit more yeah it definitely wasn't up in that village the beautiful mm. village and um a lot of the i people, guess that's a big difference a lot of the people don't even know where whereabouts you know, it sort of became a... You know, in the books and stuff, it says that you could just go and ask the town hall where he lived and everybody knew. Yeah, the postman. Yeah. But, the Englishman. Yeah, but now <laughs> it, it, it isn't like that. But it, it, I, I assume it's much more, um, multi, you know, targeted towards foreigners now than it ever was before. When you see the real estate agent as you pull into the town, mm. there were signs in English and Russian. and mm -hmm. uh, But then again, it, it had that really old village feel that we got so used to seeing as we drove through yeah. Provence. Really well-kept slash dilapidated houses mm. and cobbled streets. It was great. Mm. And I took I did take a bunch of videos that I'm going to upload yes. tomorrow. Uh, but a few more thoughts on the village. Um, it, and I think with a lot of the villages, this isn't just about Menerbe. When you see the sign that says the plus beau village de France... Mm. Make a beeline for them. It is worth it. They're so good. You know when you're pulling into a town, there's there's a few different clues to a good town that we discovered traveling. You know, people <laughs> may be listening to this podcast for the first time ever. Maybe. You've just missed the whole honeymoon season. Yeah, go back. Well, rewind we, about 20 episodes. We went 4,000 kilometers on a scooter around France. And sometimes when you pull into a town or a village, it says like a, a fleury, a ville fleury. Village, village fleury, fleury. Meaning it's flowery. Yeah, it's uh, a flowery You know you're going to get a village. lot of flowers in there. That was always nice. Or it was, the... usually a really good tell. Yeah, or sometimes it just said beautiful village. And that's even better. Mm. Because they're a bit more rare, I think. Yeah. I saw quite a lot of the, the flowery <laughs> villages, but not so many of the plus beau. And what a beautiful trip it was overall, wasn't it? It was great. So now we're recuperating and just sort of telling some of the stories from the road. I just can't believe we were, we were gone for eight weeks. Can you imagine? Uh, yeah. We left high summer, got back... It was getting cold in Paris. Winter jackets out. So lucky with the weather. It's just really trip. interesting to see the season change like mm. that. And thanks to all you people, as I say it all the time, but thanks for all your emails, your kindness, your support, uh, mm. for letting us stay at your country house, all that kind of stuff. I know, we could have been axe murderers. <laughs> we could, and you could have been axe murderers. Been We're a, lucky to be alive. It could have been a clash of axes if we were all axe murderers. Uh, but, but, uh, but yeah, it. <laughs> but, um,. But what I wanted to say is end this uh, idea with the reason I'm talking about a book today, because I've definitely talked to authors before on the show, but uh, I've never talked about a book specifically, I don't think. The reason is, is because I've started a book club. Did mm. you know that? I, I, I knew that. I think I was in your first um, yeah. member. Yeah, yeah. Those were the days. Remember those, those were the days? Day. <laughs> those long <laughs> months we're just talking about books. <laughs> no, but the idea of it is uh, every Tuesday, by the way, I don't know if I told you that, every Tuesday is not. book club day. And uh, I've created a Facebook. It's kind of, for the moment, it's uh, for Facebook users. If, you, yeah. if you're not on Facebook, maybe maybe wait a bit. So we've done that. We spent a month talking about that. Um, the average score, so the, the, the readers oh, gave an average score. Oh, you compiled the score? Mm. Okay. 6.6 .6 out of 10. Oh, it's not bad. Well, that's the highest rating book in the book club Netflix, history. If that was on Netflix, you know, or IMDb, if that was a film on IMDb, I'd, I'd probably watch it. Yeah, 6.6, .6, yeah. So yeah, it was the highest rating, but it was also the lowest rating. 
So the hope. <laughs> the hope. <laughs> Since the start of your yeah. book club, you yeah. mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I see. Okay. So the idea well, it's is, kind of a strong start. I thought it was a really good start. Mm-hmm. One, because we were on the road and we'd be it able made to sense. visit it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's sort of this book was such a such a uh, people say it was one of the main sort of fish out of water stranger in a strange land you know year in Provence it inspired loads First of, of its books kind. you know it inspired um, a year in the Marde Stephen Clark's oh, book about Paris in really? fact when I had him on this show yeah. way back he said uh, I remember he, I remember him saying to me that Peter Mayle started his book mm. uh, in January whereas that's nonsense because as everyone knows France. The French year begins in September when everyone ah, comes back. Ah, the rentrée. Exactly. I and you know see. what else? Uh, John Baxter, one of my favorite people in Paris, mm-hmm. his new book is called A Year in Paris. And that's wow, coming out. it's the male effect. I'll tell you what, that book will be a book club book. I think it's coming out in February, March. Okay, that, I'm excited for that. But also, I've chosen the, the November 2018 book club book, and that okay. is, drum roll, Suite Française by Irene Nemirovsky. Mm-hmm. Uh, World War II... Um, French woman, Jewish woman. I don't know. I haven't started reading it's it. It's going to be set in Paris, I suppose. Set in Paris or and in France, France at least. Occupied, okay. occupied Paris and France by the by the, oh, by the Nazis. So there's a book that um, you should go out and buy right away. You want to join the book club? It's on Facebook. I've put on a, a $5 a month uh, price to it. But mm-hmm. it's still in the early days. So I'm happy for people to just join, read the yeah. books. Uh, optional. And, and see if you like it. Optional for the moment. But thanks to all who've signed up on Patreon. But uh, so go on the Facebook page, find the book club, join it, and uh, yeah, get that book by Irene Nemirovsky. And join we'll, the club. We'll guys. read it together. It's 400 pages. Ooh, that's okay. Yeah. It's only a couple of days. I think it's about 15 a day. I okay, it's only 15 a day. <laughs> but anyway, let's sum it up. Um, a Year in Provence, Peter Mayo. I gave it 8 out of 10. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that, that's higher than the 6.6 out of 10 from, from the. From the uh, Readers and listeners. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll stay. I was going to say seven, but I do like the new cover. So <laughs> You're officially banned from the book club for judging a book by its cover. Well. So the book club now has one fewer member. For the rest of you. Yeah, my place is open. <laughs> Maybe place Spot is open. Is open. Yes. Uh, there'll be more coming. Uh, I'm not exactly sure when season five is going to start. Uh, I've, I've uh, not finished with the honeymoon stories yet. And if you haven't already... Sign up, subscribe on YouTube to the Eiffel Tower because I've been putting up pic- uh, videos very regularly. Yeah, check it out. Yeah, because we had no internet when we were traveling, so I had all these videos and nothing I think to they're do higher them. than 6.6. What are my videos? Yeah, out of really? 10. Mm-hmm. I think so. Well, that's the male effect. Oh, no. <laughs> all right, guys, thanks for listening, and we'll see you with another installment of the Eiffel Tower on Monday, as always. Au revoir. Unless you're a book club member, and then we'll be talking on Tuesday. And au revoir again. See you as well. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.